So last time we were dealing with gene pools and speciation and we left with this homework assignment for each person to research on one example of directional selection, stabilizing selection and one example of disruptive selection. These examples are supposed to be from something that's real, not something that's fictitious or just made up. So you should have your sources cited and each person must have three slides ready to present today. Now if you have three slides ready to present today to explain about each of these, then it's not unfair if I ask you right now to tell me which of these is which. Which of these diagrams up here represents disruptive selection, which represents directional selection, and which one represents stabilizing selection. Okay. So right now we are going to call each of these diagrams one, two, and three. When I remove one of the magic words from up here, and I show it to you, by a show of fingers, you will tell me if it matches to one, two, or three. This is one finger. This is two fingers, <laughs> three fingers. When I, if the answer is one finger, please do not show me the middle finger. Okay? Now, let's go with the first one. Secret team behind there. Here is the first word, disruptive, also referred to as diversifying, in case you might have been seeing that. Next question on the quiz is stabilizing selection. Stabilizing selection. All right. Yes. Directional selection. I hope you're holding up the right finger. Not the middle finger, please. I think we have 100%. Everybody got 100%, but I will score this quiz tonight when I play this video. Now we have some real examples, real examples in the sense that we're going to touch the examples. They're not real in, the, in, the ter in terms of like uh, an actual thing in the wild, but they're real in the sense that we are going to use models. It's a simplified description to show the structure or working of a system, a concept, or an object. Young Su, and we are having lids down, please. Right? Um, so, I would like a volunteer from the audience. Oh, I want a volunteer. Wait, but listen to the task, please. Oh. These are the materials that you have. One large beaker, one medium beaker, and one small beaker. Some seeds in here. And then you have these three tennis balls. One which came from Michael. These three represent fruits. This also represents a fruit. This is the fruit, and the seeds of this fruit are held inside of the fruit like this, way down on the inside. These fruits are really big. Each of these beakers represents the beak on a bird, like this. That's one beak. This is another beak. And here is your third beak right here. Three beaks of different sizes. Now, this model is being put together to demonstrate one of the kinds of selection. Your task, if you accept it, is to first come up here and pick the right type of selection that this model is made for, and then show me how the model is meant to work. We might need some time to think about that. I want to give you a couple minutes to think about it. Talk to somebody next to you, and if you want to come up with a partner up here to show how the model works. Then you can come up as a team. Three different types of beakers, which represent three different types of beaks, plus well, sizes. So this one's the smallest one. And then we have the middle-sized beaker, which represents the middle-sized beak in this environment. And then we have uh, the biggest beaker, which represents the biggest beak. And we have two different types of fruits that vary in sizes. So one is extremely small, probably like five milliliters in, millimeters in diameter or so. And then we have the bigger fruit, which is the size of a tennis ball. So, with this model, we can say this represents disruptive selection, and this is because of why. So, 
With the small beak, we can see that it's very appropriate for getting smaller fruits and it's very efficient so it can thrive in its environment. As you can see, it can eat a lot at once. And then with the bigger beak, it's very easy to get the big fruits. Even though it can't get the small fruits just because the beak is way too big, um, it can get the bigger fruits very easily. And then so now this is where we have to talk about the middle beak. Now, although the middle beak can fit in this container to get the small fruits, it can't scoop anything, and therefore it becomes stuck, and so it starves to death and it dies. <laughs> and some may argue that, yes, it can eat the bigger fruits. However, the birds with the bigger beak are more likely to be able to eat them just because the bigger, with the bigger beaked um, birds are a lot more efficient, and they can eat a lot more at once, making them more successful. So... Disruptive selection is when the two extreme traits are selected in, by natural selection. And so as you can see, the smaller beaks will thrive just because it doesn't have as much competition. And so this is one of the extreme traits. And the other extreme trait is uh, the bigger beaked bird, which can effectively get the big fruits. So as time goes by, um, the middle beaked bird struggles for existence and eventually dies off. And so as time passes, because it is not able to reproduce and pass on its genes, it will die off, leading the two extreme traited birds to thrive in its environment. Now, we are ready to move on to the next type of selection. And in this type of selection, we have this sample here, which is uh, a number of baby mice. And Stephanie here is going to explain to us what this evidence fits with and why. So this is an example of stabilizing selection because um, all these mice are the same size and that's because um, medium-sized mice are the easiest to deliver when the mother mouse is giving birth. So mice that are too big are difficult to deliver and it can cause some health issues with the baby and possibly the mother. And then babies that are too small are too weak to survive. So medium-sized babies are the easiest. And then all the mice will become medium-sized. Is that shown on the diagram? Uh, yeah. So like red is before. <coughs> red is before. Red is before and blue is after. So it's like there's more variety. But you know, the, like the, <coughs> it's concentrated in the middle. So now we're ready for the final example, which is Directional selection. Okay, so in this example, we're assuming that these mice live in this white environment. So, as you can imagine, these mice, they're much harder to see against this, whereas the black mice, you can see very clearly, and there's a giant contrast. So, when something is hunting these poor little mice, um, they are more likely to see the black mouse rather than the white mouse. So, um, the white mouse will generally win um, natural selection, and this is directional selection because one, or as over time, the mice will get lighter because um, it is easier to be lighter in this environment. Tell me, um, this one again, what is it? And then this one? And uh, this one, stabilizing. Now, only one of our models was actually fully realistic. Which, uh, which model was based on actual data today? The first model, the second model, or the third model? Which one, Joshua? The one with the dead mice. That's actual data. That's, these were actually dead mice. Then we have another type of model here, which is completely fictitious, but reminds you of what study? in our syllabus. What does this remind you of? Anything? Finches. Darwin's finches, which we are supposed to study how speciation happened where? What's the island? The, 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 the specific island. Daphne Major. Right? Make sure I know that we're supposed to be studying about Darwin's finches on Daphne Major. And then the final bit involving just coat color and camouflage, which now is where we will take in some of you and your research. I hope you have everything cited about the actual examples.